All right, Christian, dear devotees, welcome back to the GBC SBT page. My name is Deva Madhavadas. Very happy to be able to bring you today His Grace Mahatma Prabhu. Mahatma Prabhu, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. So we're continuing our meditation on the Chaitanya Charitamrita as a build-up to Shudor Purnima. And today you'll be bringing us through the famous Ramananda Samvad pastime. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mahatma Prabhu. Thank you for being with Hare us. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Sri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Namine Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sanyavadi Paschati Satani. So I am very honored and humbled to speak on such an elevated topic. The whole philosophy of Krishna consciousness is contained in this conversation through a process of eliminating the non-essential and then creating a hierarchy of eliminating the lower from the higher when you get to the essential. And then coming to the higher and then coming higher than the higher. <laughs> the point. But Ramananda, uh, Roy was asked a question at a certain point. He said, I've never spoken on this. This is higher than I've ever gone. So Mahaprabhu is taking it all the way to the highest. And then I have some trepidation. Uh, Prabhupada said, we should not discuss the leelas of Krishna publicly, which is kind of a problem. We should only discuss them amongst devotees who can relish them and understand them. But once you go online, it's open for everyone. So these pastimes go very, very high. And so we'll see how high we can go without going to a point where it's beyond our qualification to speak. And um, of course, sometimes we're asked to speak on these things and we try with great humility to, to repeat what we've heard from those who understand. The, the word samvad means conversation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to South India. The external reason was to preach Krishna consciousness. But really the internal reason was to meet Ramananda Roy. And Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, as we know, was a great impersonalist, well-renowned, and he was converted by Mahaprabhu. And after his conversion, Mahaprabhu asked him, you should go see Ramananda Roy. He is, he is the person to meet. So who is Ramananda Roy? Well, Ramananda Roy is Lalita Saki. And Mahaprabhu is now taking the role of Radharani because he can't understand her unless he becomes her. As the American Indians say, you can't understand another man unless you walk a mile or 10 miles or whatever, 100 miles in his moccasins. So how will Mahaprabhu understand Radharani? He can't, as Krishna, understand her, and he, he wants to understand her. He needs to understand her. And so here is Lalita in the form of Ramananda Roy. So who, who can help Mahaprabhu understand? It's Ramananda Roy and Shrubdhamana, Lalita and Vishaka, and Lalita and Vishaka. They, they can help under Mahaprabhu understand Radharani. So, although in the conversation, Ramananda Roy says, you're making me speak these words, which of course is true, but she's definitely qualified to illuminate the glories of Radharani because that's where that discussion ended. So, the internal reason for Mahaprabhu going to South India was to meet Ramananda Roy. Ramananda Roy was a governor. And when Sarvabhama Bhattacharya became a devotee, the king of Arissa, the Gajapati, was his follower. And so when he became a follower of Mahaprabhu also, that king became a follower. And as if you know the story, at one point, the king gave him retirement so he could engage fully in devotional service and he would be paid a full paycheck. 
So anyway, Mahaprabhu meets meets Ramananda Roy, who is bathing in the Godavari. Mahaprabhu is there. He's also bathing in the Godavari. So by his divine arrangement, they're there at the same time, and they meet. And um, Mahaprabhu asks, please tell me what is the goal of life? And Ramananda Roy begins with something interesting. He says, the goal of life is to follow Varnashram. <laughs> As you might say, why would he say that? Well, one explanation is that Mahaprabhu is a sannyasi, so it's kind of like a compliment. Well, you, you're you're achieving the goal. You're a sannyasi and you're following Barnashram, so you're doing it. And then, as many of you know, Mahaprabhu said, Eko Bhaya, Age. Ara, what is Eko Bhaya? Ara Kate more. I Let me see if I can get the actual Sanskrit. I forgot the last few lines, which means, Bhaya, of course, means external. Um, let me get the, it's not Sanskrit, it's Bengali. Age kaha ara. Age kaha ara means, can you say more? And to everything that Ramananda Roy said, Mahaprabhu said, can you say more? Until he got to the position of Radharani and Radha Dasyam, service to Radharani. There was, that was it, that was the pinnacle. Um, because she manifests the highest love. What more can you say? But he, when he would say it's external, naturally, he would say, tell me more. Echo Bhaya, this is external. But when he finally came to a point where Mahaprabhu said, this is good, but tell me more, which is the beauty of Krishna consciousness, because it never ends. So, but interestingly, the word Bhaya or if you're Bengal, you might say bhaija. Also means superficial. So when Mahaprabhu is saying this is external, he's also saying this is superficial. Now, the conversation becomes interesting because Ramananda Roy is backing up everything with Shastra. And he's backing it up with Shastra that Prabhupada quotes. And in some of the purports, although Mahaprabhu said, say more, this is external, Prabhupada is talking about the validity of what he's saying, which is something like when Arjuna is showing compassion and Prabhupada's glorifying him for being a compassionate devotee at the same time saying, this is the wrong context for compassion. So because Mahaprabhu wants to go to the highest, he's rejecting everything and rejecting things which Prabhupada taught us in a certain context. So one of the interesting things about this conversation is you have to understand it in context because Mahaprabhu is going to reject things which we don't normally reject. We would think, why is he rejecting this? Anyway, he rejected this because Varnashram is, there's Daivi Varnashram, but there's materialistic Varnashram. You just do your duties. Um, so when Mahaprabhu said, no, something better, then he said, okay, Ramananda Roy said, okay, well, do your, you do your duties, but do it to please Krishna. Of course, this is not pure bhakti. And the whole point of this conversation was to shine light on pure bhakti. So because it's not pure bhakti, it's like, okay, you're doing you're doing material duties within Varnashram. Well, that's not good enough. All right, well, then do them, but samsidhi haritoshanam. That's your perfection. They're for pleasing Krishna. And if it's still, it's still 
you know, you're doing it because you like it, but you're offering it to Krishna, and that is not pure bhakti. So Mahaprabhu is saying no. So then, Mahab, um, then Ramananda Roy says something very interesting, which caught my attention a few months ago. We were discussing this pastime. So one of my friends, he said, I hadn't, I hadn't read the Ramananda Sambhat in a long, long time. So he said, what's the verse where, which Mahaprabhu accepted? And I didn't remember because I hadn't read it, and so I had to guess. And he said, so I thought, well, it's not Yad Jehoshi, Yad Jadoshi, Yad. It's not Yad Karoshi, Yad Ashnasi, Yad Jehoshi, Dadasi, Yad. But if you do offer to Krishna, I understood that. That's not pure bhakti. So then I thought, well, what's the comment? It was it's a guess because I couldn't remember. I hadn't read it. And I said, Sarva Dharma Puritya. And I thought, okay, you know, that's got to be logically. <laughs> he said, No, Mahaprabhu rejected that. And I said, Really? Show me. Show me. Um, and so this is interesting because at first, at first glance, why would you you would think, why would you reject? That verse, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's context. When Prabhupada says Sarva Dharma, surrender to Krishna, and in this context, it's different. Because once Prabhupada said, when Krishna says Sarva Dharma Prityaja, and Lord Chaitanya says chant Hare Krishna, it's the same. So taken in that context, then, you could say, well, that's the ultimate, because Mahaprabhu came to give the Yuga Dharma, which is the Prem Nam. So that's the ultimate, you know, that's the conclusion of all the Vedas. If you if you don't come to that conclusion, then you've lost. And you come to the conclusion to chant Shuddha Nam, that's the goal. Okay, fine. So Sarva Dharma means chant Hare Krishna. But Lord Chaitanya is seeing it in a different context. And I have something I'm going to read because this, this came up. This came up with Prabhupada, this very thing. Hmm. Actually, Prabhupada gives a talk on this whole, Prabhupada, there's a whole book on this. I want to find the section where Prabhupada talks about it. Um, And maybe, anyway, I'll paraphrase. Uh, you probably you probably remember that Prabhupada would often say, "Why did Mahaprabhu come? Because he asked people to surrender, and nobody surrendered. So he had to come back and say, "Okay, you know, forget surrender and all this. Just chant Hare Krishna." So one of Prabhupada's comments on on this is why did Mahaprabhu reject it? Because he came as Krishna and nobody followed. Nobody could do it. And he's like looking back and saying, well, I asked them to surrender and nobody surrendered. They're all like, they're, they're become like animals now in Kali Yuga. And um, so he said, that's not gonna work anymore, surrender. But of course, when Prabhupada used this word, Sharanam or Prabhupada in the context that Prabhupada gave us Krishna consciousness, it, it was much different because strictly speaking, if you analyze Bhagavad Gita, strictly speaking, when the word, when you say surrender unto me, it just means, okay, okay, give up Varnashram. Like all those duties, just give it up. You know, be Paramhansa now. You just give up those duties. So that was also rejected a rejected way of thinking that's that's the way mahaprabhu was thinking he said so i give up you told me do varnashram then you tell me do varnashram for krishna now you tell me sarva dharma now you tell me well actually just give it all up but mahaprabhu is saying all right i give it all up then what then what do i do there's nothing there's no explanation of what to do it's just okay 
now I'm renounced. I've renounced Varnashram. Then what? So that's why Mahaprabhu didn't didn't uh, accept that. But when Prabhupada talks about Sarva Dharma Purajaja, first thing is we're not giving up Varnashram because we weren't part of it. <laughs> so totally different context, right? Just give up all, give up all religion. I didn't have any religion. I was not part of Varnashram. So for us, giving up means give up all your sinful activities. Now, this is also interest, interesting discussion, this verse, because the application is different for different devotees on different levels. So for a person who is a smarter Brahman, you can say, Sarva Dharma, give up your smartness. Smarted, smartedness. Yeah, that's a good word, right? Give that up. <laughs> it's, you know, okay, give. You don't need it. It's just getting in the way because the real thing is, the real thing is something higher. For us, give up your, as we said, your sinful activities. You know, Krishna is saying, I'll protect you because you're giving up duties. What duties are, are we were all sinful. We weren't doing much pious, if anything. So Krishna is saying, give up sin, give up piety. For us, it's more piety. But there was an interesting discussion Prabhupada had with one of his god brothers. Sharanam braja means go surrender. The word braja means go. So, sharva dharma purityaja, give up all and just surrender to Krishna. But it's not clear how do you surrender, you know, what do you do? That's going to come up later. So that's why Mahaprabhu rejected it. But when Prabhupada was having this discussion with another god brother, he said, sharanam braja. Um, that means go to braja. And so, and so the discussion was, this verse is interpreted as the gopis surrendering to Krishna in Braja and Ras Lila. <laughs> so that's my point. Depending on where you're coming from, you understand verses differently. So if you're coming from, well, just, just give up Varnashram. Okay, now what do I do? That's not much. That's, there's no pure bhakti there. And... I'm going to surrender, but what does that mean? There's no actual description. Okay, man, mana, baba, man, bhakto, but where's the sadhana? What do I do? What does the surrender look like? It's not clear. And, of course, by Prabhupada's mercy, he made everything clear for us. So when we talk about surrender, it's a different context because Prabhupada's showing us, yeah, rise early, chant 16 rounds, follow these principles. Um, preach Krishna consciousness, read these books, and so on. So when we talk about surrender, we have a different context. So that's the context of this. Go to the next verse. Because when Mahaprabhu says, no, that's external. <laughs> So Ramananda Roy has to say something else. Hmm. <laughs> he's going through, you know, he went through karma, Mishra. Now he's saying, well, okay, if we have to say something, it was just kind of give up. Well, okay, what do you do? Okay. Jnana Mishra Bhakti. Mishra means mixed. And he quotes a verse from Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma. And you might think, well, it's a fine verse. When I become self-realized, then I take to bhakti. But um, in the commentaries, in the context, Mahaprabhu rejects this because, well, Brahma Bhuta means jnana mishra bhakti. It means one of two things. Either your attempts will simply be to merge in Brahman, or you will use bhakti to become liberated. You know, I'm just doing Krishna consciousness so I can get out of the miseries of this world. So that's called, that's not pure bhakti. You might say, but it's an impetus. Okay, it's an impetus. I want to get out of here. But at a certain point, I need to get beyond that impetus to have a pure motive. I was talking with a devotee the other day. And this devotee was saying that she has seen many, many, many devotees come because they're suffering. And she said, but the problem for many is 
suffering has has was their motive and suffering becomes their main motive for being krishna conscious like i want to become free from suffering I want to get out of this material world that's a good impetus in the beginning it pushes us but if it remains that way then and we don't develop a pure desire to please krishna not to get free from suffering then we remain in a very neophyte position so this brahma bhuta prasanatma it's jnana mishra bhakti so mahaprabhu rejects it no, no, we don't want to serve Krishna just to become free from misery. That might get you in the door. Like some things get you in the door to bhakti. Okay, I'm in the temple. Why? Because it's really bad out there. Okay, now you're here. Now develop bhakti because you want to serve Guru and Krishna for the real reason, the right reason, not just to become free from suffering. So Mahaprabhu says, sorry. Now, um, um, so then Ramananda Roy says, okay, you know, it's like it's going gradual. Okay, bhakti without jnana, jnana shunya, shuno. Shuno means zero, shuno in Bengali. Well, this is all in Bengali. And I lived in Mayapur, so I can give you my best Bengali accent. Jnana shunya bhakti Prabhu kahe eko bhaya age kaha ar raja kahe jnana shunya bhakti shajya shar It's the best I can do. Shar. The, so, he said, well, he said, first he said, bhakti mixed with karma. Mahaprabhu is like, they don't want to do bhakti to get something material, that's offensive. If you chant the holy name to get something material, that's considered one of the offenses. He said, all right, we'll forget about material things. Let's do bhakti to get liberated. No, because you're still motivated by personal desire. So then he says, bhakti without the desire for knowledge or for liberation. And so he's eliminated now Karma, which is the desire to get something material, and gyan to be liberated, to be free from misery. So then you have anyabilashita shunyam, gyana karma anabnabritam. You have that famous verse, right? That um, bhakti is free from gyan and karma. So this is what he's come to. And then he quotes a verse, and I'm juxtaposing this to the discussion of sarva dharma because I just found it so interesting that. Mahaprabhu is rejecting surrender, but it turns out he's not rejecting surrender because once we get rid of the karma and gyan and then we go to the devotee and we learn how to do bhakti, then he says yes. So here's the verse that was supporting gyane prayasam uddhapasyana monte eva. This is a verse spoken by Lord Brahma. Um, give up your gyan and Jivanti sa mukaritam babadi abartam. Go listen, hear the nectar from the mouth of pure devotees. And Stanes that Prabhupada would quote this line. He'd quote this verse a lot, sometimes just this line. Stanes tita shutikatan tanubanma manobir, wherever you are, just listen and ye praya sho jito jita jito pi you will conquer Krishna. So, so here's the idea now. The original Sarva Dharma was, all right, you give up Varnashram, then what? Mm, I don't know. Just so that you're kind of in nowhere's land. Okay, so then he says, well, then, then do bhakti, do your, you know, Varnashram, but add some, you know, just do it for Krishna, you know, you like it. No, no, but it's, Still not pure. All right, then go for liberation. Forget all that. No, no, no. Still not good enough. That's that's. So when Prabhupada says sarva dharma pritya this is what Prabhupada's talking about. This is his context. So okay, you're going to give up gyan. You've already given up karma. We've given up karma. We're going to give up gyan, which is this desire to have anything material. Uh, any liberation, and then we're going to going to go to the feet 
of a guru, and we're going to hear from his lotus mouth how to do bhakti. So that's a big emphasis on hearing, hearing, hearing. You cannot overemphasize hearing. You you ever have trouble in bhakti? Just hear more, because hearing, hearing. God, how can I say this? Hearing pierces. Hearing is association of sadhus and hearing from them is by far the best way to pierce maya. If you ever have trouble in bhakti, or not only not just if you're having trouble, if you want to take the elevator in Krishna consciousness, if you want to go up, then you hear from the sadhu as much as you can. Because when you're hearing from the sadhu, you're getting their realization. Their realization is entering your heart. Their words are piercing your maya. And you're getting realizations you and understandings you could not get on your own, or it might take you your whole life. And they're giving them to you, and you get them like that. It's just, wow, that's amazing. I, ne I never understood that. Yeah, and you might have never understood it. But then you associate with a pure devotee who has these deep realizations, and you hear from them. And then you start to become transcendental by hearing, even if you're not transcendental. All of a sudden, that hearing process lifts you to the transcendental plane. And that's why Prabhupada would often say, you don't have to do anything. Just sit there and listen. I was like, that's not that hard, is it? You have two ears, sit there and listen. But once I was in a class and Prabhupada said, while you're hearing Bhagavatam, automatically you're in the mode of goodness just by being there. Stane stita, just sit there in any position, doesn't matter what, but somehow they hear the sadhu, which coronavirus has enabled us to hear many sadhus online and hear their realizations and their understandings. Now, I often listen to my god brothers because they understand Prabhupada's teachings and the teachings of Acharyas, often with a nuance or an angle that I never perceived, I never understood. So it's not that even as a disciple of Prabhupada, I would only listen to them. You you see how ISKCON was made, Shima Bhagavatam class every day, and Prabhupada didn't say, play my lecture. He said, you give class. So Prabhupada set that up, and I was just thinking the other day, you know, well, there's so many classes online, maybe we should all just stop and just put Prabhupada's classes because we want to keep Prabhupada in the center. We want everyone to hear from Prabhupada. And certainly, it's a good idea to put up more of Prabhupada's classes, as Vani Pedia is expertly doing, kind of pushing Prabhupada in front of us so we see his quotes, we hear his classes. And for me, hearing Prabhupada is a, it's a special experience, not only hearing what he's saying, but just hearing his voice and remembering remembering him because I feel he's I feel just as if he's right there and and so it's special I can't replace that that emotional experience and and what I get from hearing Prabhupada and 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 oftentimes Prabhupada will say things and then I'll give a class and I, I will say exactly that or sometimes I say something and then I hear Prabhupada and he's saying what I said because I got it from him and it's just it's it's very special but in spite of that, the, the um, realizations of my God brothers were often very, very deep in, in areas, or they've gone very deep into certain aspects of philosophy for which I haven't had time to study as deeply as they have, and I benefit. Or I haven't had time to contemplate it as deeply as they have. And so I benefit greatly. So... This is, this is where everything changes because now Mahaprabhu doesn't say eho baya, he says eho hoy. Good, he says. You got it. We're, we're moving somewhere. This is, this is the beginning, anyabhi lashita shunyam. So I, I want to say something about this because, you know, the natural question comes, well, if this is where bhakti starts, so we should have no desire for jnana or karma, and as I was explaining previously, that so many of us get in the door because the material world has a trident behind us. 
saying, and Durga saying, hey, did you get the point? <laughs> Try to enjoy. I'm pushing you into the temple. Did you get the point? And so that's why we're there. So it helps us, definitely helps us. And it still helps us. And, and then we become devotees. We're conditioned souls who've had unlimited lifetimes in the material world. And so we find that our hearts are still full of desire. So how can we be anyabhi lashitam shunyam? No desire. And so Rupa Goswami comes to our rescue by saying it's not the desire, it's the motive of bhakti. And the motive of bhakti is in our hands. We have control of our motives. We don't always have control. So what do you do with desire? You tolerate it. If that desire is not favorable for devotional service, you tolerate it. That's what you do. And then when you serve Krishna, tolerating your material desire, you serve him. Krishna, please accept this. I'm a fool. I'm a rascal. I'm offering this to you. Please accept it. This is all I can offer you is my devotion. So you have a million desires, mountains of desires, right? Tolerate them. And secondly, well, fulfill them in a Krishna conscious way if you can't tolerate them. And secondly, when you serve Krishna, the motive is not to fulfill those desires. The motive is to please Guru and Krishna. That's it. And if that is your motive, technically speaking, that's pure devotional service. Now you might say, well, I don't feel like a pure devotee. Fine. But you've, you've done something which is motivated purely by the desire to please Guru and Krishna. There's a beautiful story. One of my favorite stories. Srila Prabhupada was doing a big initiation and he couldn't chant on everyone's beads. So... Prabhupada asked one of his disciples to chant on the beads. And the disciple obviously felt totally unqualified. He's chanting on the beads of his god brothers and god sisters. And he's probably at that point was a devotee three years. He said, Srila Prabhupada, I do not feel pure enough to chant on these beads for your disciples. And Prabhupada said, my order is pure. If you follow my order, your chanting will be pure. There it is, that story. That's the icing on the cake of this broader definition of pure devotee. I'm a pure devotee in practice. I'm an apprentice pure devotee. I'm practicing pure devotional service. That pure devotional service means it's on the order of higher authority and I'm doing it to please Srila Prabhupada. I'm doing it to please my spiritual master. I'm doing it to please the other devotees. I'm doing it to please Krishna. Although I have a mountain of material desires, I'm not serving for that purpose. And that control, Prabhupada said, that's a really important point. Don't doubt this. Prabhupada said, that control, your motivation, what will motivate you is in your hands. Even though you have so many desires, your motivation is in your hand. So that's the idea. So when we talk about anyabhi lashito shunyam, make all desires zero, and you think, well, I have so many desires. No, it's make all impure motives, the motive to be, I'm serving Krishna uh, just so I can have a better material position or to get some something material from Krishna or some relief from suffering. If that's not the reason, you're just doing it to please Krishna. That is a broad definition of pure devotional service. And that conforms with this definition of Anyabhilashita Shunyam. And the good news is that if you chant in that way, that is a kind of pure chanting. Now, to call it Shudhanam would be kind of a big step. But I think we could safely say it's on the higher rungs of Nama Bas when you're coming to this point in your chanting where you are chanting to please Krishna. You are chanting with the goal of becoming a pure devotee, with the goal of rendering pure devotional service. 
That is why you chant. That's the mood. That's the meditation. Krishna, I want nothing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I want nothing. I just want to be a pure devotee. I want to please Prabhupada. I want to please you. Please help me. Hare Krishna. I need help. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Uh, my heart is full of dirt. Please purify me. Hare Krishna. That's your only desire. That comes in the realm of the broad definition of pure devotional service. Your only motive is to please Krishna. So that immediately upgrades your chanting. And then if you stay in that mood as you progress, you will come to the stage of nishta and beyond. And then your chanting will take that level of purity to come to the stage of ruchi. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about the word surrender because I think it's an important word and um, the word Krishna uses is sharanam. Sharanam also means take shelter. So when we use the word surrender, sometimes it can have a negative connotation, right? Surrender means you give up everything, you've lost your free will, and basically you become a slave and some person will just deal with you as they whimsically feel. So that's not what, what it means. One of the definitions of surrender that Prabhupada gives, and which why Krishna says, Masuchaha, don't worry, is that Krishna is my maintainer, Krishna is my protector. That's one of the, the, the six definitions of surrender. So instead of approaching it like, oh, I'll become a slave, who knows what Krishna will send me to Siberia to peel potatoes for the rest of my life. That was the joke we had in San Francisco in 1970, the temple president said, if you don't do what I ask you, I will send you to Siberia to peel potatoes. Now the devotees in Siberia who peel potatoes might find that kind of funny. But that's the, especially the ones who like it, like peeling potatoes in Siberia, they'll find it really strange that we would say that. But surrender means, one aspect of surrender is that I'm protected by Krishna. Nobody can harm me if Krishna doesn't want it. Or the other word, sharanagati. Um, and that's why Krishna says, Masuja, don't worry, just jump off the mountain. Don't worry. Um, I can give you protection. I'm quite competent. You don't have to worry about it. Just jump, take that step. So when Prabhupada uses the word surrender, this is what he's talking about, this, these six kinds of surrender. Now I have another interesting story about surrender, which I find useful and clarifying what this word means, at least from Prabhupada's perspective. So one of our lawyers in the mid seventies who was helping us keep legalize and keep the airports legal, he came to meet Prabhupada and I didn't know him, I wasn't dealing with him, but apparently he had been reading the books. Maybe he had to read them just to represent us, I don't know, maybe he was interested. But he asked Prabhupada how long it takes to surrender. And so, you know, one way of looking at it would be, well, it will take your whole life or many lives. And Prabhupada said, it takes a moment. And then Prabhupada defines surrender as you accept Krishna. You accept his instructions, and that means you're surrendered. So here, this example we're giving, if I give my life to Krishna with faith that Krishna will take care of me, that, that is what you do when you accept Krishna's instructions. Now you're surrendered. Just took a second, one decision. Krishna, I'm yours. I am yours, you are mine. Well, there are different levels of bhakti. I am yours is the um, higher stage. You are mine. I am yours. But the beginning stage is whatever you ask me to do, I do, and I trust you will protect me. So that's what that's one definition, one way Prabhupada explained surrender. Um, and you can do it right away. Uh, that's another important point. It's not a gradual process. 
And of course, you may know the six items of surrender that you find in the CC. I have a story about one of these items, which is, which is a, I think, a very helpful story. It's guided me in making lots of decisions, difficult decisions. There was a man, his name was Ramanuja, I believe, or Ramanuja, Ramanuja. He was initiated as Ramanuja. He was a professor, and I believe he joined in Portland. And he was in his 30s when he joined, and that must have been about 1970. I think it was in his mid-30s. And for us, of course, that was, at that time in ISKCON, it sounds funny now, but that was like the elders of ISKCON in 1970 were in their 30s. Like, I think the supreme elder might have been 35. So 1970, I was 20. And so this man joined. I was like, oh, an older man has joined. This is unique. And I think our Amala Bhakta Prabhu also, he, I was in Los Angeles when he joined. Now he's a sannyasi, Maharaj. I think he was in his 30s also. Oh, this old guy in his 30s has joined, you know, some you know, relic from the Iron Age, you know. For us, that was old. And this man was a professor also. So this kind of unique situation, a little older than us, a professor, not dropping out like we did, not a hippie. But his wife and children weren't coming along. Well, at least his wife wasn't, and that meant she didn't want the children to come along. And she was not vegetarian. And, and he was very into Krishna consciousness, he was initiated. And so he was wondering, Prabhupada, what do I do in this situation? And interestingly, Prabhupada did not give him a specific practical instruction, but gave him the instruction of the first two items of surrender, which is do what's favorable and avoid what is not favorable. Interesting, right? There's often devotees say, or often devotees are, are in this situation. Their spouse is not a devotee. What do I do? And, well, what's favorable? Well, you could think, well, what's favorable would be to leave the family. Not necessarily. It may be favorable to, to keep the wife and children happy, keep your devotion private, let them go on, be a good father and good husband. Maybe that's the most favorable. It's difficult to say in every situation what's the most favorable. And so Prabhupada, you know, often you don't know because you don't know the situation. So Prabhupada said, here's the principle. Do what's favorable, what will help you advance and avoid what's unfavorable. So when we say surrender, um, the question we can ask ourselves is, is there anything now that is favorable for my bhakti that I could do or or more importantly, or more specifically, that I should be doing, that I'm not? I think we should all answer that question. We should all meditate. There's probably more than one thing. But if you could know one thing that you feel really you should be doing, it would be better. And that could be simply like getting up a little earlier or chanting more rounds in the morning or chant or focusing more when you chant. It doesn't have to be a big mammoth feat. It can be something much different. It could be um, dealing with a persistent anartha that you've been putting on the back burner because it's difficult to deal with. And is there anything, the second law, uh, if it's unfav if it's favorable, do is there, you know, so that, that example is not good. It goes with this one. Is there anything unfavorable I need to give up? Is there anything favorable I'm not doing that I could do or I should do? Is there anything unfavorable? that I am doing that I should give up. This is surrender. So when Prabhupada speaks about surrender, he's talking about it in this aspect. And then ultimately, Prabhupada has asked us to give our lives for spreading the Sankirtan movement. So when Prabhupada's talking about surrender, he comes up in this broad context of, of removing anarthas, doing what's favorable, depending on Krishna, and spreading Krishna consciousness, giving giving your life basically to spread Krishna consciousness according to your position and situation. So um, Prabhupada never promoted Varnashram. Varnashram, uh, in the beginning, he promoted surrender. Now someone might say, well, we need Varnashram because not everybody can surrender. That's true. But for us who have come to surrender, then we're not gonna backpedal. We're gonna continue.
are surrendered. There are people who can, who would come to Krishna consciousness if they didn't have to fully surrender entirely, and they can go gradually for, for an ashram. So even though Mahaprabhu is rejecting it, uh, when Prabhupada was asked, well, why why aren't you rejecting Varanashram? Because Prabhupada brought up about 1974, we should do Varanashram. And it was like, where did that come from? Because he never spoke about it. And he said, you know, not everybody can do sadhana. So we want to encompass everyone. But he said, Mahaprabhu is a sannyasi. He's transcendental. He has nothing to do with this world. And so he said, but we... We are in this world, we are concerned about everyone. So Varnashram was Prabhupada's big net to encompass the world. So you have to understand things in, in this way. So, um, yes. So a few other things I would like to read about surrender and then we'll finish the story and then we'll take some questions. Surrender means God is there, I am there. We reciprocate. Surrender means to rise early, bathe, and go to Mongol RT, even when you lack spontaneous love to do so. Surrender is to follow all the rules and regulations, even the small ones. These are quotes by Prabhupada. Uh, and then we have, again, example of protection. Uh, a devotee's self-surrender means he wants nothing in return for his service, only he wants Krishna to be pleased. One time, one time, Prabhupada was asked, "How can we love you? Or what does it, what does it mean to love the Guru?" And Prabhupada said, "It means to follow your vows." <laughs> wow, interesting, right? Um, you know, so we we really want to get definitions in line with with the mood and message, the clear message that Prabhupada gave us, because, you know, love, well, love means preman, it means, you know, then you can divide it in, into different categories of love and and then go all the way up to, to above, within prema, and then eventually to mahabhav, and, and um, which is where this conversation is going. And I want to tell you a story about that. Such a beautiful story. There was a discussion on what is love of the gopis. What is love in the mood of the gopis? And so you, you can analyze it because the our acharyas have analyzed it because there's so many stages of love and what stage does this gopi have and what stage the coward boys are on. And, and you can analyze it as you go up. You know, the various, once you get to prema, that's just that you entered the room of love and then you divide it into different levels. And as you go up in the rasas, then there's more st stages of love added to it. So they're having this big discussion. And Achyutananda Prabhu, he said, he's so brilliant. And he said something brilliant and funny. And he said, I can explain what Gopi Bhav is, because they were talking about Gopi Bhav. What is it? He said, I can explain it. Gopi Bhav is when you're 70 years old and you have no money. You get on a boat and go to America to preach Krishna consciousness. That's Gopi Bob. <laughs> I love that. And then uh, Rameshwar Prabhu asked Prabhupada, this was his realization. He said, it's, you know, Radharani, her position, Radharani's position is a, a, a kind of getting ahead of myself in the conversation, but I think it's okay because we can tie it in this way. Radharani's position is that, as you know from the Rasa dance, she was felt feeling ignored, so she left the rasa dance. And then Krishna's thinking, "There's all, thinking, there's all these gopis here, but I'm not happy. She's the only one who can fulfill me, and and she knows that that she's the one who gives Krishna the most pleasure. But she wants her gopis to interact with Krishna and have that opportunity. So she often brings gopis to Krishna. So Rameshwar said, "Well." You know, we're introducing people to Krishna. It's like we're bringing people to Krishna. Isn't that in the mood of the gopis and Radha? And Prabhupada said, yes, you've understood. So another way of defining, you know, what is gopi bhav? Although you might say, I don't have gopi bhav. I don't even know if I'm in that rasa. But it's a it's a broader definition in in 
in a particular mood of the, of Sankirtan, of Mahaprabhu. And just as a side point, this conversation, um, it as it continued, then they continued all the way up you know, in the various rasas, except Shantaras. They didn't go to Shantaras. Um, and Shantaras is Mahaprabhu came to give four rasas. It's Chatur uh, Bhakti Bhavadiya. It says in Chaitanya Chatur, he came to give four rasas. So Shantaras, he didn't come to give. So Ramananda Roy doesn't present Shantaras, but he's Ramananda Roy says um, the eagerness. Your, your qualification is your eagerness to be in rasa. Um, that is your qualification. Lolium, we've heard this word, greed, sometimes translated as greed. Your desire, where does that desire come from? Again, associating with devotees, um, it's everything. It's the real qualification, not your past piety, whatever. Your desire to have Krishna consciousness, your greed for it, your, your like the story of the, the guru putting the disciples, well, how do I, what's, um, how do I understand desire? You know, how should, how much should I desire? For spiritual advancement, and he pushes him under the water. And, let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Comes out. And he says, "Yeah, that much desire you should have." So, when we have that much desire, lolyam, then um, we're ready for spontaneous devotional service. Um, so then he goes through the different rasas, beginning with servitorship, and then through friendship, and then paternal affection. And each time he goes. Then Ramananda Roy says, excuse me, Mahaprabhu says, that's good, but can you go further? And as I said earlier, then he went up into conjugal ras and said, oh, that's good, can you go further? And Ramananda Roy said, I don't know, I've never, I've never spoken about this. And then, and then Ramananda Roy speaks about the love of the gopis. And then he speaks about the love of Radha specifically. And, and, um, and there it is said that when Radha is enjoying with the gopis, they experience they experience it a hundred million times more than she does. Hare Krishna. That's think about that. That will keep you up at night. She experiences they experience it a hundred a hundred more times than she does so you know i'll have this you you learn the position of the gopis particularly the manjaris how they are dedicated to radha and then you think well don't they want krishna directly and when you hear that they're experiencing what radha is experiencing even, even much more intensely then you understand um what that means um how they their radha is their worshipful goal of life and this is called radha dasyam service of radharani so this conversation ends at this point and this was something that i didn't understand as a new devotee i was only introduced to this concept after i'd been a devotee about 10 years and it was it was like oh it was like this world had not been introduced uh, to me um and I didn't fully understand it from reading this. And then I heard more about it later, that this is the aspiration of uh, the highest aspiration of the Gaudiya Vaishnava to be, to be a servant of Radha. So that's where this conversation ends. And um, as we said, Ramananda Roy was saying, you know, I've never spoken about these things before. This is like your you're making me speak. I wanted to just end with an interesting point about this, which will be relevant to all of us. And and generally, um, these topics are so high. I didn't want you know other devotees may may teach about want to teach more about these things, and you are probably all wanting to tell us more about the gopis. I'm like, um, I just never personally got that mood from Prabhupada. That that's you know something we do so much, so publicly. Um, but 
when Ramananda Roy is saying that my tongue is like a string instrument and you're playing, so you're making me speak. This is interesting because according to the desire of the audience, it can influence Krishna to make us as speakers speak things which we don't even know and we speak them, they come out and like, wow, where did that come from? And Mahaprabhu exhibited that when he was asked for the second time to speak the Atmarama verse. And he said, I can't remember what I said. And then he spoke it again and he never touched on any of the explanations. Could you explain the Atmarama verse? 64, well, I explained it 64 different ways before. Could you explain it again? I can't remember what I said. And then he explained it again in different ways. And so the point is that according to the context and the person, Krishna will inspire a devotee to speak, even to speak things he didn't understand. And the interesting thing about this, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but so interesting that Lord Shiva said that Making this point, he said that even Vyasadeva may not actually understand the Bhagavatam, even though he spoke it. Hmm. That's interesting. And Shiva, Lord Shiva said, I'm not sure he understands. I know Sukadeva Goswami understands. I understand. I'm not sure. Vyasadeva, maybe he understands. Maybe he doesn't. I'm not sure. So this point was made. He said, Mahaprabhu said, you know, I spoke these 64 interpretations, Aparama verse, but since Sarvabhama is a madman, I'm a madman, and this is what came out. But this is what comes out from an eager audience. It draws, your eagerness draws from the speaker more and more rasa, more and more nectar. So we've gone almost an hour, and um, I think... We will have time for questions, although um, I don't see questions in my, oh, I didn't have the comment box. Um, so now I can go look at your questions if you have any. Um, but if you have any questions, this is the time we want to answer them. Um, yeah, um, you can post your questions here. And you know, if you don't post questions, I ask you questions that you can't answer. So, you know, um, one of, people often ask me. They say, "Well, how do you how do you study Prabhupada's books?" Oh, there's so many ways you can study, but one of the ways um, that I study is I ask questions. Like a, I think of a question, and then I try to answer it. It's uh, it's an interesting way to find answers in Prabhupada's books to some query. So, Iyani, you want to ask a question? Um, um, Arjit Roy says, Arjit Roy says, you can ask your question, Iyani, and then I'm going to answer this question. I am initiated in a non Vaishnava sampradaya, but regularly, regularly chant the Maha Mantra. Will I be ever able to become a pure Vaishnava without leaving my present guru? I just add Prabhupada. As long as your guru is okay with it. Um, this has sometimes happened in in um, Gaudiya Vaishnava history because um, let's say you want to pursue bhakti in the mood of Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Additionally, then you want to get the Maha Mantra. You want to chant the Maha Mantra and you want to get that mantra from a Vaishnava guru. Maybe in your sampradaya they don't give Maha Mantra. So then you can get and add it. It's, you know, it's really a discussion to have with your present guru, but it's been done before. So um, we could talk about it personally if you'd like, because um, I don't know your situation. But Maha Mantra, it's for everyone at all times. And of course, Prabhupada has given the Maha Mantra, so you're already getting it from Prabhupada. So I would suggest that you... Take guidance from Prabhupada's books, chant the Maha Mantra. You can take guidance from his senior devotees. It will just empower you. 
it will empower you in so many ways. So Yanni has a question, but I don't see it. So, um, mm. now, oh, we have a question, another question. Rasangi, is this the original Rasangi? <laughs> the real Rasangi? <laughs> you mentioned that you learn more and more angles of vision from hearing from your godbrothers. I am assuming that you meant hearing from your godbrothers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. Hare Krishna. Yes. Um, just the other day, I was listening to um, these wonderful talks on Narottam Das Thakur by Sitala. Amazing classes. Everyone should listen to them. Yeah. We mean, yeah, you have to forgive us, Rasangi. When we say God brothers, we mean God sisters also. We, we mean he and she when we say he. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> mm. Okay. Is there any account of Ramananda Roy's guru? Uh, whom did he associate to get this knowledge manifest in his hard conversation? He mentions that Bhutri Chaitanya is making him speak in the manner he did, but that does not nullify the fact that he was regarded as a highly real. Yeah. Realized as Sarvabhoma mentioned him. Well, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's attempt in South India. Yeah. Um, the my understanding of that statement is he came to a point where he said, I've never, I, you know, Mahabharata asked a question and he said, I've never been asked this question, neither have I ever um, thought about it, but by your will, I will speak it. So in that case, Mahaprabhu was his guru in this conversation. As far as his lineage and grew, unfortunately, I don't know. Does anybody know? Um, I'm not sure. I don't recollect. But in this particular situation, actually, it was Mahaprabhu, who was his guru, who was making him speak. And I was just sharing my own realization that I have, and I think we all have this realization, that I have, um, yeah, Vishaka, I'm sorry, yeah. I got it mixed up, Vishaka. Um, I, um, I and many of us have the experience that sometimes we will have to speak and the audience will draw out of us something that we will we'll end the class and say, I never, I actually didn't understand that until I spoke it. So it doesn't minimize our guru or say that we're surpassing him but it's the mercy, by the mercy of the Guru, by the mercy of Mahaprabhu, then Ramananda Roy is speaking. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I got mixed up. Uh, um, Damadar and Damadar, as I understand, is Alita and Ramananda Roy Vishaka. And they were the, of course, Gadadhar Pandit is Radharani, and they were guiding Mahaprabhu in how to um, relish and, and experience and enter more deeply into the moods of Radharani. So, um, you know, this question, um, um, who is who? I was reading uh, a little bit about, you know, sometimes you read that some, some acharyas say so and so is this personality, and some so and so is a combination of this person. And there's some disagreement. And after reading a lot of those and studying a lot about the Leelas, I came to the conclusion is anything's possible. Not that we want to speculate and say it's all one, but there is there's so many things which are possible that are not possible in the material plane, which are possible in the leelas. 
but as far as I understand, they're not both. I just got mixed up. Lalita and Vishaka. So Saruptamana Ramananda, they're they're guiding. And also, it's also interesting that Ramananda Roy appears as a Shudra. And just like the gopis appear as simple village girls. So that that point is also part of Mahaprabhu's Mahaprabhu's uh you know what he's teaching. Here's here he's taking a so-called shudra. Of course, we know this is not a shudra, but for the vision of the world, I'm taking a sudra and I'm making this shudra speak on the highest level. I'm making the shudra speak everything that I came to teach, everything I wanted to teach in this one conversation. This so-called shudra is speaking it, just as Mahaprabhu did with Thakur Haridas. So he's, you know, this is such an important point because Prabhupada came and did that with us. And then we were the ones who went back to India and uh, were teaching Indians. And we were wearing Brahmin threads, which infuriated the Brahmins. But Mahaprabhu is teaching this in his own example. Um, hmm. Uh, hmm. Yes. Um, also, in 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 hearing about the position of Radha and the Gopis, uh, we're always warned to be a little cautious and. Uh, a little reverential and to be aware of our disqualification. Also to be aware, we're not minimizing that this is the highest thing, but to tread with some caution to the highest level because uh, these, these leelas are extremely purifying if we can enter into them and it takes some qualification. And I've always said that it's, it's such an impetus to become more detached, more purified, more Krishna conscious. It's such a great impetus because when you are, you can enter more deeply into this understanding. And this is what Mahaprabhu came to give. He came to give this understanding. So if we, if we disqualify ourselves by our lack of purity from being able to understand the depth of these leelas, then it, it's like we defeat his purpose in a sense. Not that we can defeat it, but we defeat the purpose for ourselves for which he came. Because ultimately, this conversation, it's really, it's really demonstrating what Mahaprabhu came to give. This is what he came to give, the highest level of ecstatic love as exhibited by Radharani. That's what he came to give. That's what he came to teach. That's what he's putting before our eyes. Here, I'm going to give you this. Nobody even knows about this. And I'm not just going to teach you like servitorship in Braj or, or just by Kunta, by Kunta Bhakti or by Kunta Prema. I'm I'm coming to give you this. So how sad it would be that we we can't grasp it due to our impurity. So I've always found that um, the impetus, one of the, my great impetuses, is that a word? Impetuses, a great impetus to be a little more renounced, a little more purified, etc., is to understand that there's a big prize for that. And that prize is you can actually fully embrace the gift that Mahaprabhu came and fully embrace the, the gifts of the Acharyas who've come to give it and explain it. But otherwise, as, some, as a lot of you know, when this topic came up with Prabhupada, he said, if you're not qualified, then you'll be, instead of purified, you'll be put putrefied. And I did a little investigation, and I found out that generally within Gaudiya Mat, they were very, very careful about going into these leelas, at least publicly. And publicly means with the devotees themselves, and reading certain books, like Ujvala Nilamani. You have Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which describes all the rasas, and then Rupa Goswami further writes Ujvala Nilamani, and uh, 
It's all about Madhurya Ras. But he never read it because Bhakti Siddhanta said, don't read it, it's too elevated. So Sridhar Maharaj is a very elevated devotee, God brother of Prabhupada. And when he was asked about the book, he said, I don't know, I've never read it. But he did say something interesting, which I think is very important for us. He said, you don't have to read a lot of books because all of this becomes revealed by pure bhakti. So I'm trying to understand Krishna's position in relation to the gopis, Madhurya Ras, the various levels of love, Radharani's love. And I might think, well, I need to read all our Acharya's commentaries on the 10th canto. And I'm not saying you wouldn't want to. And there's so many books, other books. Um, but our, our understanding is that, as Prabhupada said, don't read a lot of books. It's, it, it can become an anartha to just accumulate knowledge. Because ultimately, all these things cannot be understood from books. They have to be revealed in a pure heart. So I've always found that really a, a really um, motivating point that if, if I do a little tapasya, maybe I don't want to give up something like we're saying, but I do, it gives me the ability to go a little deeper into understanding and experiencing Krishna consciousness, especially the more esoteric aspects, which is the real prize of your austerity, that you can feel some of what that, you know, a taste, a shadow of, of Ruchi, uh, of relation with Krishna, uh, insight, uh, some realization like that. So Krishna says, Jama karma chame divyam evam yoveti tattvataha. If you understand my janma and my karma, my birth and actions, tattvata, then you'll be liberated. But that's the qualification. And how will you understand it, tattvata? Though there's some degree of purity that's required to understand it. But um, by your greed, by your pure intention, that you will understand. Hare Krishna. So, yes, there's our there's our host, hostess with the mostest. I was happily watching from the background the whole time. Uh, thank you very much for such a wonderful discourse. I, I appreciated at the end you tying in that point about Srila Ramananda being an apparent sudra, and how Srila Prabhupada's own disciples were apparently also lowborn. And yet that was part of the intrigue of their spreading yeah. the and yeah. the potency that came. It was a sweet connection. I um, want to thank on behalf, of, on behalf of GBC SBT, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu, for coming on and discussing with us Ramananda Sambad. Uh, our whole meditation this month is on the Chaitanya Charitamrita and this distinction between you know, useless knowledge, Gyan, essentially, and the, this Tattvataha that you were just mentioning, Krishna, extols us all to develop this understanding of his Leela. And, and that's really the way to enter in is powerful Shravanam. So thank you for giving us that opportunity over this last hour. You're welcome. We You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. We always look forward to having you on. So hopefully again in the yeah. near future, we're able to. Yes. Why not? Please, please keep track of us here on the SBT page, especially over the next three weeks, uh, four weeks, as we build up to Gaur Pranim, we'll have many more wonderful speakers discussing uh, the Leela of Mahaprabhu. Thank you again, Mahaprabhu, and Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hari Hari Bo. Gauranga Nitananda.